Welcome to The Pulse with me, Daniel Dazzi. In our first story, in our headlines, blows, gunshots, and total pandemonium cuts registration short at Ewutu Senga East constituency. What, what happened there was, how Akumsen came there, how Akumsen, the minister for special whatever that ministry is called, she came there, stood there, instructed her boys to shoot and kill people at the centre because it was not a warning shot. Some of the shots, uh, the bullet shots could be found uh, on stores in people's houses. So it was to shoot, it was a targeted shooting. From the Minister for Special Development Initiatives who has been accused of instigating violence. Also, the latest on COVID-19 as police cracks down on persons without masks in Accra as Marcus disinfection kicks off today. And Progressive People's Party elects new national executives. Is this the winning team or are they fighting a losing battle? We speak to the new national chairman, Nana Okoriwusu. All this and more coming up within the next 90 minutes. Stay with us. Let's start from the Ewutu Senya East constituency in the central region where gunshots are fired. EC officials had to flee for their lives and NDC and NPP candidates nearly in fisticuffs and the military had to be brought in to maintain law and order. All these were happening today at the registration of voters. Now, in case you have lost, you are lost by the mention of that district, it's located in Kaswa. Um, eyewitnesses say the men numbering at least 15 arrived at the Step to Christ Registration Center around 8 a.m. and tried to sack some prospective voters. This resulted in a scuffle that saw gunshots fired and three motorbikes burnt. Correspondent Joseph Akablay is there for us and will join us shortly. We also have the Electoral Commission officials on standby for this. But first, the NDC candidate Phyllis Na Koyo. Uh, the situation in Kaswa here, here is more like a war zone. Um, normally, I wake up in the morning to do my usual morning monitorings um, across the various registration centers. And there is one center which is just um, adjacent to my house. Um, this morning, I went there to greet them, then moved to other centers. Then uh, I remembered I had to take something from home to give to someone, so I just got home. Then I heard warning shots. I heard gunshots. I don't know whether I was warning shots. I heard gunshots. Three. So I moved out and I saw a lot of people rushing towards me, towards my house. Then I asked what was going on so they narrated the incidents to me and I moved to the center myself. Well, what happened there was how Akumsen came there, how Akumsen, the minister for special whatever that ministry is called, she came there, stood there, instructed her boys to shoot and kill people at the center because it was not a warning shot. Some of the shots, uh, the bullet shots could be found uh, on stores in people's houses. So it was to shoot, it was a targeted shooting. Three shots, then three motorbikes were banked down. Listen, this is not the people of NDC that she is attacking. She is attacking the good people of Ghana. She's attacking the good people of Kaswa, the, the, the wise people of Kaswa, and the Kaswa people in Kaswa are more discerning. They see what she has done and they will they will they will reward her for her actions. Listen, we are talking of policies, we are talking of development, we are talking of good initiatives. Eight years, what have you brought on the board? Show us what you have done for the good people of Kaswa. If you cannot show us, stop killing us. We are tired of the brutes, we are tired of these hooligans, we are tired of these uh, shootings, we are tired of beating us. The people of Ghana, the people of Kaswa have worked up. We are ready to defend ourselves now. We will not sit down for people to look unconcerned. We will not sit down for the police to look unconcerned. The good people of Kaswa, the good people of Ghana would rise up and defend ourselves. We will not sit down for that woman, that woman. She is a woman. I am their woman. And that is the difference between the two of us. I will forever stand up and protect the good people of Ewutu Senya is constituents. Because of this, the center here has been closed down, has been shut down. 
we don't know when they are coming back because the EC officers fear for their lives. This is what someone who calls herself a mother can do to the good people of Taswan. Thank you. He said the police command himself to the grounds. They were there to survey. They said the investigations are ongoing. We have picked uh, uh, the boys that uh, had their motorbikes bent to go to the police station to also put in their statements. So from there, we would see what we would also do as a political party, as a leader of a constituency, and as a, as, as, as a mother who, who governs the people in this constituency. We would also sit down with opinion leaders and take our now, Joseph Akablay joins from the scene now with more. Uh, Joe, we understand there was nearly a uh, blow at the, at the police station later that day. Yes, uh, Daniel, as I speak to you now, uh, we just moved from uh, the police station where uh, the two candidates were out for minutes. In fact, it's nearly uh, generated into fisticuffs when uh, the two candidates clashed. They had to be restrained by policemen and military personnel who had been called in to come and assist. Uh, while the supporters of the NDC uh, were some few minutes away from the police station, uh, the supporters for the NPP were much closer to the, poli the police station together with the MP, Howard Hinson. And I've been engaging a member of a team, a campaign team. They dismissed and denied the allegations that have been leveled against them. But the police had to come in, and we understand that four persons are currently in their custody. Uh, we understand a weapon has also been seized, a gun. One gun is in the custody of the police as part of the evidence. And these individuals, the police say, are connected to the shooting and the burning of the motorbikes. You can listen to uh, Chief Superintendent Kosonu. He is the divisional commander for Kaswa. The police stations, registration centers. So we went there and found that there was a competition between some people and three motorbikes had been burned. With the federal investigation, we arrested four people uh, in connection with the, the damage of the motorbike. So now we have transferred them. Uh, we are in collective investigation. Mm. If you say the same, the same offense, it's the same offense. So we have arrested four people in connection with them. What about happened at that at, at investigation center? Are these individuals you picked from the site or you carried out investigation and you them elsewhere? But we decide to go on patrol to pursue them and we arrest for in a vehicle. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we ask the official, official to continue investigation. But the, 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 they said they, they, they want to contact the original office to go further directly. So we have the and they waiting. So even today they can sign. Now everything is set. Once we are arrested, uh, uh, those suspected to have been committed of them, they think everything is going on. Men on the ground, what have they told initially as to what exactly transpired that led to the violence? Oh, well, uh, they, what they told us, what I've already told you, that uh, some people came there and they were confronted with uh, two parties or two groups of people mm -hmm. uh, and they tried to fight them and they were in the process of trying to fight for a thing. Did you see the, those who arrested, where they found it in the guns? Uh, so what far, type of guns are we looking at? So far, we have another investigation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, leave that, that's what they say. At least can you confirm that they have guns when they are arrested? We have yes, seized one gun. We have seized one gun. Commander, if you say some people, who were they? They are suspects. Mm -hmm. From where? Oh, now we are numbers, just we don't know what they are for. We haven't, we haven't taken the gun from here. So we are investigating. So we are not going to get them to give a statement. Ask us to their side. Right, Joe, so it looks like very little is known about what actually sparked that violent scene this morning. In fact, uh, all the individuals who are here, the eyewitnesses who witnessed the whole incident, they all disagree on what exactly transpired. Uh, the point they keep on making is that uh, some of them are coming to register. Uh, they saw some individuals who came in a vehicle and told some guys who were on a motorbike and had some persons close to them to move away from the registration center. Uh, they refused to move away and then they told them to take their bikes away from the center. They said it was at that point that a gentleman got down from the car, started firing shots, seized the motorbikes, and put them in a bush and set the motorbikes ablaze. And so the real question that remains is, why did they want those individuals to leave the registration center? That is the question that no one can answer here. The NBC's response to it is that they came in there to intimidate them and prevent their members from coming in to register. The NPP 
denies that particular allegation. And so all those are matters that we expect the police to uncover in the course of their, registry, their investigation. But what we can report for a fact is that uh, the home of someone who was close by was raided by bullets. Registration has been suspended. In fact, the electoral officials had to run away from the scene, pack the equipment quickly, and left the scene. And no registration is taking place currently, Daniel. So these people who came in a vehicle, um, who were they affiliated to? They are alleged to be affiliated to the MPP. The MPP denies the allegation. In fact, I spoke to uh, Kojo Enim. He's a member of uh, Mr. Akumsin's campaign team. Uh, Mr. Akumsin herself, I engaged there. She declined to grant an interview, but she told me that uh, they know nothing about what's happening and they are expecting the police to get to the bottom of it. And that's why she had come over to the police station to observe what is uh, happening. But as far as the NDC is concerned, they are the ones behind this particular incident. And so the police says uh, mm -hmm. they are not naming the individuals. They, are in, they intend to investigate and get to the bottom of this particular matter. If not for the military right. intervention that was called uh, to the police station, it would have been very difficult and quite chaotic here. And uh, divisional commanders, they had to come in to assist, move the supporters away. And the supporters only left the scene after the individuals had been moved away from the divisional command as the police took the tactical decision to keep them at a, an enforced facility instead of this particular station because of the numbers that were increasing. Now, in that interview, Joseph, that you just had with Phyllis now Koyo, who is the NDC's parliamentary candidate, she stated clearly that Mavis Howard Homsen commanded her boys to shoot to kill. At any point, has it been established that Mavis Howard Homsen, a member of parliament, was there at any point in time? Those I interacted with, the eyewitnesses, a number of them claimed she was there and had told the people not to run away. That's what one eyewitness said to me. Uh, but the member right. of the campaign team that I engaged only said that uh, she has no idea of the violence that happened there. She was not the one behind it. Uh, those who, the eyewitness who said they saw her said she only told them not to run away in terms of those who were fleeing the registration center. And so they also cannot tell whether she was behind them. Some say she was behind, others say she only came in and told the people not to run away. And so at this stage, it's an accusation and counter-accusation. The police would have to get to the bottom of this one. Joe, thank you very much. Uh, it looks like there's still a lot that is left to uncover. We'll leave you to do that and have a clearer picture uh, a bit later. Joseph Akable is our man on that beat. Um, so what we do know is that that particular registration center, the Steps to Christ registration center at Ewutu Senga East has now been closed. There's no registration ongoing there as we speak. There was a violent incident this morning involving the shooting or the firing of warning shots and also the burning of motorcycles, of course. It's claimed by some that these were not just warning shots. These were shots that were intended to kill. We have this exclusive footage of how it all started. Take a look. The woman you see in a white T-shirt um, who is being pushed back looks like the Minister for Special Development Initiatives, um, Dr. Madam Mavis Hawa Kumsen. She's the Member of Parliament for Ewutu Senior East. You see in that shot there, there is a man in a smock uh, as well who is who was walking towards Mavis Hawa Kumsen. Now. We understand that what we were told by eyewitnesses this morning uh, was that there was a car that came there. It, it seems like these persons were sympathizers of the MPP. They came to meet some persons in three motors, on, on three motorbikes at that registration center. That is the Steps to Christ registration center at Kaswa. They asked these persons on the motorbikes to leave, and that is when it degenerated into violence. And so we are trying to understand exactly what happened. Now, Phyllis Na Koyo, the NDC's parliamentary candidate for the area, she joined us on telephone. Uh, Madam Na Koyo, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us on The Pulse. Um, good afternoon to you, too, and good afternoon to all your lovely listeners. Right. You seemed quite um, inflamed when we spoke to you earlier. Um, have you been able to assess exactly what's happened earlier today? Yeah, sure. Yeah, what mm -hmm. happened is that uh, um, as a parliamentary candidate, I normally go around um, doing normal monitoring. That's the normal routine I do. I go around to the branches to where the registration centers are to assess the situations and see uh, whether there are complaints and all that. So there's this branch which is just around my house. It's not too far from my place. 
where um, because it, it's not far from my place, I often go there every morning. Then that's my first point of call before I go to the other places. But uh, strangely, today when I went there, Hawakumsen was there. Uh, she talked. She talked to the people. I waited. She finished. Then I also greeted the people and moved to other centers. So I came home briefly to pick up something. Then I had some warning shots. Um, I wouldn't call it a warning shot. I had some gunshots. So I asked my guys what was going on. So I had to call the police and ask ah, what was going on. Then I, I saw flames coming up. So and what, what, what the information I picked was how I was there. So I quickly called the Divisional Police Command and the district police command as well. So they moved to the site, then I moved there. And when I got there, the information we picked was how I was there with her boy. She normally moves um, around uh, with some hooligans, uh, with guns, knives, machetes, and all that. And where have, have you seen? It? Have you seen her um, moving around with persons armed with guns and knives yourself? Oh yes, this is phase four of the exercise, and I would say on authority that so far. 17 uh, or 12 people have been injured. She moves with these guys in car. Myself, I have been chased by these guys. But the funny thing is that you see, they are not from, some of them are not from the constituency. They are guys from other places. So they don't know the, uh, the terrain. So I managed to maneuver my way through other areas within the constituency and flee. But what I'm saying is, She's always moving with these guys, and everywhere she goes, there is a bloodshed. Have you ever there reported is... any incidents to the police? All the cases have been reported to the police. The guys that have been injured, the guys that have been hurt, all the cases have been reported to the Kapswa police station. Were you all there the when the incident been... occurred this morning? Were you there when this violence broke up? No, I was not there. I was home. And as I said, my... From my house to the place, it's just a walk. In, it's just a walk in the sun. So you could hear the gunshots. You could, you could, you could see the flames of fire in the atmosphere. You could see everything. So I moved there personally. When I got there, the police, the divisional command, the district command was there to ascertain the scene. Then I asked some eyewitness what was happening there, and the, the narration of the story is that the woman was there. Uh, do you know, funny in love, I would say, I would even say that uh, the situation on the ground, I would even say that it was an attempt to come and distract the electoral process there. Because, one, you're looking at proximity. My house is not far from the station. It is, you, when, when you walk, it is less than a minute to the place. It's not far. That's two. I moved right from the universal uh, uh, station. So Universal Oil, where there is another registration center, where she was seated with her boys there. So it looked like well, as soon as I moved, they moved to follow me. They thought I was going to the registration center. So I would, I would even boldly say that it was, it was, it was an attempt. It could have, it could have been an attempt on our coil's life. But mm. lo and behold, I was not at that center then. Mm. But even looking at proximity, my house is very close to the place. What did you come there with the boys to do? Why would you stand there, fold your hands, and instruct the boys to shoot? Why would a bullet go through somebody's house, through somebody's shop? Why would you gather, why would you ask your boys to gather motorbikes and burn them, set them ablaze? Mm. Why right, but, but all the same, you all the you same. Are a woman of substance. Madame Nakoyo. If you your... say you call yourself about some past, mm. an MP and a minister for whatever initiative it is, I don't know. Madam Nakoyo, you, you, you have, said, you have said earlier that you were not there when this is, these incidents that you, 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 you described, you were not there when they occurred. You said that earlier. Yeah, sure. Great. And, and so at the, police, at the police station is where we want to go next, because I understand the footage we are looking at now on the screen is you almost getting into a fist fight with, with the Member of Parliament. Um, what happened there at that police station? Oh, you know, funny enough, <laughs> Hawa has lost it this time. You know, and, and thank God it is not just 
she knowing that she has lost this, but the good people of Kaswa, the good people of uh, Ghana knows that she has lost it. So she, 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 she's just fumbling and, and creating chaos all around. You got to the police station. Then you came out. You insulted me, saying that if I had your sight in my family, I would have been happy. And if I had a uh, Hawa type in my family, my family would have gone here. Because Hawa is baller to me. A P3 teacher, I said, now you cannot even um, tell um, me. Um, 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 let, let's stay away from the personal attacks, please. Um, no, no, so that's what you... happened. I'm giving you the. The, that, the, the front, uh, confrontation. I, I was listening very carefully. I was listening very yes. carefully, and I heard you yes. move from describing what she said to you responding. Now, now I, I see you there wearing a red, surrounded by police officials wearing a red um, exactly. polo shirt, like you were when we interviewed you. So you were there. You began exchanging words, and what happened? Yeah, because she insulted me, saying that I wouldn't deserve even her. It said, is that? If I had someone like her in her family, and you know, I don't need someone like Hawa in my family because my family is better off than what she's doing. Right. So let's stick to what happened. Let's stick to what happened. So there was an exchange of words. Mm -hmm. She said she would beat me up. That is what she said there. Okay. And you know, when you when you want to insult someone, or you want to exchange words for someone, or you want to say things for someone, you should do a proper background investigation of the person before you throw your words about. You see, all what she's doing, she knows she's lost it. The people of Kaswa do not need her anymore. You know, I believe that uh, being a mature person and being more intellectual, right. well, she's not, so that is why she would ask that. Uh, again, again with the personal attacks, again with the personal attacks, this is not the platform for that, Madam Nakoli. No, I'm, I'm building my that... premises. It is because you are asking me... You, on have the made a, you have made a statement directly imputing the person of a Minister of State, and we are asking... I won't allow her to make a statement like this about well, you either. Well, she's not acting on the, as on one. The same, on the same platform. I won't allow well, her to speak not, like this she's about not, you not Because either. she's not acting as one. Right. She's not acting as one. Let, let's stick to the facts of what happened today. So after there was an exchange of words, I told the two of you walking towards each other, uh, did you fail a police? Did you file a complaint with the police? What, yeah, we had already filed your... complaints right. with the police. Right. The, the, the police made four arrests, and right. they have been sent to the uh, Chip Coast. Who are these the four people? Made... Who are these Sorry? four people? Who are these four people? Yeah, the four people how I brought to Step to Christ. The branch is called Step to Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the four people Hawa brought there to shoot and to bend the car, to pour pepper spray into the eyes of the ordinary Ghanaian. And one man who is physically challenged, who was taking videos of the incident, was brutally beaten. The other five people, the four people that perpetrated that act. Have these so people been taken to the hospital? The police, and the police went chasing them and made some arrests. So four people have been arrested and have been sent to Cape Coast. Have these people been taken to the hospital? Yes, um, they have made their statements. Um, they have gone to the hospital. They are, I'm, I'm just to receive the, the forms. They have called me that they have arrived at the hospital. So they are being taken care of. Right. Uh, Phyllis Nakoyo, thank you very much. Uh, beyond thank this, you would, you be, would you be interested in seeking any legal action after this? Yes, um, I don't take decisions alone. Um, I would have to communicate with my party hierarchy and the rest of the Akatamansonians to sit down and decide on what to do next. Thank you very much, Phyllis Nakoyo, for joining us this afternoon. You're live on The Pulse. Let me just inform viewers that um, Mavis Hawa Kumsin, as the Minister for Special Development Initiatives, um, has declined to speak to us. We, we made several attempts, several attempts to get her to join this conversation. Those attempts have been unsuccessful as of now. We'll try and get an answer from her or from anyone that she was with and get a sense of what their side of the story is. You're live on The Pulse with me, Daniel Dazina. We move from this story, though, and snake bites are a major health concern in many parts of the country. One of the communities battling this problem is Fasin, a town in the Ahanta West municipality of the Western region. But... Victims often do not get treatment because, a lack, because there is a lack of anti-snake venom. Uh, now, my uh, colleague, Henry Kisibidi, was there 
And here is his report read to you. Very painful. You can never sleep in the. He in, 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 said, You can never sleep one night. That's 35 year old Let's Emmanuel Kujo, a snake bite survivor, recalling how he endured sleepless nights after he was attacked by a snake in his house a little over a week ago. He's now doing well, but says it's not been an easy road to recovery. Emmanuel was first given aid at the chips compound in his community. But even before he went to the health facility, like many others who suffered his fate, he resorted to some herbs to ease his pain. When the snake bat me, I went in for uh, onion and chew. and chew. And look, I went in for this thing, uh, Do you know Kukoyam? Kukoyam leaf. Kukoyam leaf. Not the leaf. The down one. We are just it for my hair so that 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 gave me a lot even though anti-venoms are covered by Ghana's NHIS they are not available in many chips compounds and other health facilities across the country like that of Fasin. health officials here have resorted to some unconventional methods as a result of the rising cases a traditional antidote known as Blackstone is what is deployed here. Rita Abanga is a physician assistant at the facility. Here, we don't have the anti-snake serum. So what we do is that we use the Blackstone. But do the Blackstones suppress the venom? Rita tells us more. With the Blackstone, if there is already blood coming from the site or the cut, on the site is obvious. You just place the black stone on it. If it is a snake, um, it will stick to the site. And after some time, it will fall off. After it has absorbed the poison, as it is believed, it will fall off. Other than that, if you are not seeing any cut at the area or any uh, snake flung at the area, what you do is you create a small cut with a surgical blade. And then you place, so the blood can ooze a bit, so that you place the black stone on it. Victims are, however, referred to hospitals miles away from where they live for effective treatment. You do the person, you, you, you give the person first aid, and then you refer the patient. You are not in a hurry to let the patient go home because you don't know what can happen. And venomation, some snakes take time for envenomation to set in. Other snakes to... You, you get them the moment the patient reports to you. So if you, you can't keep the patient for long in your facility because it's a chips. You refer the patient to a place that he will get health care or he can be detained and observed for, for further um, signs. Yes, and then appropriate management will be given. That is what we do here, basically. Okay. This sometimes comes with its own challenges for some patients. At least two people have recently died from snake bites here in the last few years. Gabriel Menu and Mesre Nyame lost their relatives through snake bites, even Omen, some five and ten years ago. Uh, my brother was working at the security post at the time when he was bitten by a snake. We tried taking him to the nearest hospital miles from here, but unfortunately, we lost him on our way. My nephew went hunting and sustained a snake bite. Due to the lack of transportation and bad roads, we could not transport him to the hospital on time and we lost him. We could not transport yeah 
According to a Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research Finding, Ghana has since 2015 recorded an average of 9,600 snake bites yearly, with some resulting in fatalities. Municipal Health Director of Ahanta West, Timothy Kobna Ofori, tells Shaw News snake bite is widespread, adding the antivenom is only available in two out of the numerous health facilities in the community. We have quite a number of cases concerning snake bites in the municipality. For instance, in 2017, we recorded 16 people having snake bites. 2018, we had 18 people having snake bites. 2019, the number increased to 42. And in 2020, even as of June, mid-year, we have recorded 17 people who have been bitten by snake. So that's how it is like. Even as of June, middle of the year, 2020-17, we are also projecting it or adding to it. It's likely this number is will go high. For the snake bites, what we've done, you know, we have two major referral centers now with doctors. This group, which is the main municipal hospital, and then we have Aguna Health Center. It's a health center, but has a doctor with other physician assistants. So that place has also been furnished to be able to cater for this kind of condition. At Fasten, snakes are taking lives and many more are getting injured. The poor community dwellers there look to responsible okay, health well, system uh, yeah, to provide I them with you medicine to, grab and to, uh, to save food. lives. They are allowed to do that to the villages because we are all Ghanaians. We, get to, we are all Ghanaians, so we have to drink, bring the drinks uh, the to the villages because we went to bush so that we bring the food or to, uh, to, or to them too. Now when you come, when something bites you when you come to the hospital, there's no need to drive over there. How can animals survive? How to die? Henry Kusibe, this report for Joinies. As we're live on the pulse here on the Joy News Channel, now a combined team of police, military, and environment task force operatives are on the streets of Accra as part of efforts to strictly enforce COVID-19 protocols. Maxwell Agbaba encountered some culprits asked by the task force to also desil drains and other spaces as part of a phase two disinfection and fumigation program to complement efforts to reduce COVID-19. Infection. We're here um, at the Ambublushi market. Um, basically, what is happening um, is a cleaning of the markets after yesterday's um, disinfection and fumigation exercise. But let me speak to uh, the general manager uh, for Zoom Lion. They are supervising you know, this exercise and also helping with logistics and other things. Yesterday, we began the second phase of the nationwide um, disinfection fumigation exercise. So we're able to do all the 29 MMDAs, uh, the markets, that's around 137 markets in Accra. And as part of the work that we did yesterday, we came around today to do a cleanup because we use big machines. There will be flying of rubbers and polythene bags. So we came back today to clean the streets and clean every mess that has been created. And you know, with the COVID-2, sanitation plays a greater aspect of it. But what we have observed here today is that um, the soldiers and the policemen who have been deployed here, um, what they are doing here is that if they find you and you're not wearing your face mask, <laughs> they'll call you and ask you to help in the, the silting of the drainage system here. So some of the people you find here um, were not actually wearing their face mask, and they've been asked to join um, the, the, the cleanup exercise against their will. For instance, this gentleman, he wasn't wearing his face mask. He's been asked um, to help the team doing um, the cleaning exercise. Um, and that was what we found when we visited um, the Domin markets as well in the Gang East Municipal um, Assembly also. Um, Police personnel were deployed on the streets and what they were doing is that as they 
cleaning exercise was going on in the domain market. Persons who were not worried, um, were not wearing the face mask, were asked to join in the cleaning exercise. I want you to show what is happening, I'll show you what is happening there right now. You can see that soldier standing very close to that young man. He was not wearing a face mask. He was called to join in the cleaning exercise. He has been forced to buy a face mask, and now he's going to be given rooms to join the exercise. This is against his will. You can see clearly that he really does not want to do it. So all of this man you're seeing um, in the in that drainage system were not wearing their face masks. And the military men um, here, Asked him, asked them to, you know, um, join in the clearance. Wait, what's happening here? He says, I'm going to talk about it. Uh, my car did uh, this thing. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Jenny Market inside, so I'm going to take the, my truck. Uh, my, uh, I'm going to push the truck, go. And, uh, so why, why were you kneeling down? Why, why were you on the floor? Uh, I'm begging because I'm going to tackle it, but I'll be late. Well, you were asked to join the cleaning exercise? No, I'm going to I'm going to uh, tackle it. So if I no, join no, the... were you asked to join the cleaning? cleaning? Were you asked to join? Uh, that's why I'm begging. I'm you were not wearing your face mask? Well, you? I'm, uh, because they call me, you know, the time I picked the call, you know, I, I'll, be, I'll be late. If I answer them uh, calling the face mask inside, the person is not hearing the call. Uh, oh, okay. okay, so wait. You are saying that if if you have your face mask on, the person would not hear you on the phone. The person is not hearing me. Put it under your chin. The is under my chest. So, please, okay. I'm begging. And now they want you to go and work and say what? Well, I, I beg. You I are beg. going to talk about it. Yes, but of course I'll be late. It's still live here on The Pulse on the Joy News Channel with me, Daniel Dazzi. We'll take just a few messages. When we come back, we'll be joined by the PPP's new national chairman. Stay with us. As I live on the post with me, Daniel Dazzi. Now, the West African Senior Secondary School Certificate Examination, WASI, has begun today, July 20, 2020. It commences amid concerns about health protocols in place to ensure containment of the spread of the novel coronavirus. A total of 313,837 SHS finalists are sitting the exam today across Ghana. The timetable, which was submitted to the Ministry of Education, indicates that the examination will begin today with project work for visual arts students, while the theory papers will start from August 3, 2020 until September 5, 2020, when the examination will be brought to an end with principles of cost accounting and technical drawing. Right. Um, we'll, we'll bring you some details of this examination. Um, but first, we know that about 60 subjects made up of four core and 56 elective subjects have been made available to all the candidates, and it will last for a period of five weeks. Agnes Tekujo is the head of public affairs at WIAC. Today's paper is mainly for the candidates who are hoping visual art. So it's a visual art project work that has been done by about 5,380 candidates. What we are started with today is what we call the idea development or planning for the actual project work. So the questions were given to them about two weeks ago so today they are planning for the project work that will take place from tomorrow. We have some candidates who are open basketry, they do already leather work, culture and all that. So today they are sketching and planning the uh, execution of the actual project work. So have you visited any of these centers today? Yes, we were next door to um, Afra High and there at that center we had a total number of 44 candidates to 45 candidates to see um, paper with two offenses. As we are far high, we were working on um, leather work and culture. For those students who may test positive um, for COVID-19, but they are candidates for WASI, what happens to them? Well, unfortunately, um, any candidate who positive and is on isolation or cannot take any of the tests. We have to take advantage of the next edition of the examination that was in November. 
you know, we have a policy, an already existing policy, that we don't administer examinations at hospitals. So if for one reason or the other, a candidate is unable to write a paper at all, you know, then the candidate will have to take advantage of the next edition of the examination. However, if you have a candidate who comes to the examination hall and takes, let's say, English paper two, which is a month paper, and then maybe the candidate develops some um, illness or sickness and cannot write the new paper, we can put in place the clemency protocols that we have. Right. But if it's able to take a paper at all for one day or a number of days, um, we have advantage of the um. addition of the examination. That was Agnes Te Kujo. Now, Kofi Asare is Executive Director for Africa Education Watch, an education NGO which is calling for a review of the WASI timetable. Mr. Asare, it looks like your call was ignored. WASI began today. Yeah, um, yeah good afternoon and good afternoon to your cherished audience. Um, our call was specific to the examination papers to be written on the 5th of September specifically um, principles of financial accounting and then um, um, and then uh, cost accounting. And so um, it is not about today's paper. It's actually the last paper to be written. And the issue Why? is that mm. business students will have to sit for six and a half hours, six and a half hours from 8.30 to 4.30 on that day. Six and a half hours of um, examination assessment is not consistent with international benchmarks. And so we we were approached by the students and also by the Business Education Teachers Association. And that's a group of teachers who teach business subjects in senior high schools. And then um, and then uh, we decided to together with them petition YAEC. We've been engaging YAEC for the past two weeks. I'm talking about the teachers themselves on this issue. But we had to go public yesterday because um, the results were not forthcoming. But today, we have heard WAEC indicating that they are forwarding our petition to the examination subcommittee for possible um, action. And so we are hoping that a review of that particular paper, which is on the 5th of September, is done. It will only take the postponement of the second paper, which is from 2 p.m. to 4.30, to the next day. And that's it. Right. So what you're asking for is for the second paper to be postponed to the next day. Exactly. The second paper is supposed to be done from, I think, 2 o'clock, from 1.30 to 4.30. It's three hours. It's a Saturday. And so we are proposing that if it's possible, um, that paper should be postponed to the Sunday in the morning so that by 12 o'clock, the children are done and then they can go home. That is the last paper. And so those who wait on campuses to write that data will be only the business students. It is very important because WIAC don't normally organize two elective subjects in a day. It will either be an elective subject for a science student and another elective subject for a business student. But you will not have one student doing two elective subjects in a day. It is, it is uncommon. And so the stress levels are higher because these are two elective subjects for business students. And that is why the concern came from the students and their teachers, for which we are um, supporting right. a review on the tactic. Right. Now, now, how practical is this logistically? Because, of course, it just seems like a paper is going to be shifted to another day. But already, government has released 70 million Ghana cities to schools to cover these exams. Um, we are going to have to keep students for another day. That means they are going to have to be fed. I'm talking about students across the country. So, and it's a Sunday, which conventionally doesn't often happen. So it might have to be moved to a Monday. How practical is this request you've made? Well, um, if, you, if you look at the cost of doing this, uh, then I would rather tell you that we budgeted for keeping about 1.2 million children in school from March till December. And we have a situation where COVID has intervened. And so we are spending less on feeding, spending less on other recurrent expenses because about 
seventy percent of the children have been at, have been at home since May, since March. And so when it comes to um, resources, there should be an issue. We are actually making huge savings in view of children being at home. And so an extra day at a school for only business students shouldn't be an issue. That's less than about 70,000 or so. It shouldn't be an issue. The second issue is that this is a Ghana examination. Nigeria has pulled out. Liberia is still sitting on the fence. They haven't drained yet. And Gambia is also not drained yet. They're still not reopening schools. And so basically, Sierra Leone only reopened school two weeks ago. And so they don't have timetable for Sierra Leone. Ghana is the only country that has gotten to the point of having a timetable. So we are talking about a Ghana only timetable here. It's not a West African thing, which will cause you know the derailment or visit will more or less cause some changes to be done at the sub regional level. No, it is only a Ghana timetable. And so right. having this thing will not be too much of a, a, a an issue. Right. Ultimately, our, our our children are those who stand to benefit because. When you assess a child for six and a half hours, you are actually putting more stress on the child than, in effect, assessing the child on the merit of their own academic right. um, progress or academic their, their competency levels or their level of academic mm. attainment. The stress I, 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 simply, so I, I simply wanted to draw your attention to a point you raised earlier, um, which was on the savings that, that will be done on the educational level. But we know that COVID-19 has taken out 11.4 billion Ghana cities as far as our, our budget is concerned. And it's this same money which needs to be managed to put students back in school and also to provide relief for private businessmen. It's generally a very stretched budget we are dealing with. Uh, so it, it, it may not exactly be fair to say that we've already saved money because students were not supposed to be in school, right? Well, the point I'm making is that the cost of stressing students to the extent that they wouldn't be able to come to the show when it comes to the examination day, because they will not be able to put up their best, which may culminate in a bad performance, that cost is higher than the cost of feeding children for just one day. That's all I wanted to say. Right. But we don't have resource constraints. That should necessitarily be discussion, because as I'm saying, we, at the, we have a budget to keep 1.2 million children in school for the whole of this year, about about 180 um, schooling days this year for the two semesters. But we spent most of the time at home. And so we have made savings. That's the point I'm making. And so the issue of finding money to feed about a quarter of the students who are writing that I'm business students alone, for just one day, shouldn't be an excuse not to reasonably space the final paper for us to get a good result of our assessment of our own children. Bear in mind that WIAC is a contractor. GOG has engaged WIAC to assess their students for them. Mm. And so GOG has an upper hand mm. in all this, not WIAC. Mm. And then we mm. expect the GES to actually lead in mm. this engagement mm. because GES will be the first person to trumpet mm. achievement when we, when we record a very good uh, right. result from this WIAC. Right. Thank you very much, Kofi Asari, for joining us. He's with Africa Education Watch. Now, in the northern region, there are 40 students who are sitting for the first paper at the Tamale Senior High School, Tamasco. The assistant headmistress in charge of academics, Nimoni Celestine, told Joy News the students are well prepared for the examination. We spoke to them last week. We have prepared them psychologically, asked them to go all out for the exams. In the midst of the convicts, we have a veronica bucket even at their classroom before the start of the exams. Soap and water. Also giving them sanitizers to sanitize their hands and wash their hands alongside with the exams. So all is at the exam center. Now, you spoke of um, having talked to them. When you say you've spoken to them, what did you tell them exactly? Because of the pandemic, we try to remove some fears in them. Even though they are healthy, we ask them that it's normal. They have not studied much. They have stayed in the house for long. But when they came, we have classes to up to Friday to prepare them for the exam because of the days they have lost in the house. So we were speaking to them to be courageous, to take the exam as a normal class exams so they can pass the prior 
How was your reaction? Concerning the exams? Yes. They were happy. They knew they were written this exam a long time. They know they were finished school, waiting for their results to go to tertiary. And because of the pandemic, they stayed at home. So they are anxious to write the exams and finish school. Some of the candidates expressed their excitement with Joe News before sitting for their paper. In fact, I, it was not even in the house. When we are in the house, one is it. But the first, the latest time or the little time I'll get, I'll make sure that I learn something before I sleep. When I'm going to sleep, I know that the next day I'll be writing exams or I'll be doing it. So I make any effort to work a question or to solve an exam before I go to bed. How do you feel now that the exam is here? I, I feel, let me say, I feel happy because I know very soon I'll be completing, and not just a matter of completing, but I'll be, I'll be moving out of school, and I know by God's grace, I'll feel, I'll, I'll find the exams, I, I am happy of myself, and I feel happy. How do you feel now that the exams is here? I'm very, very happy. I'm very, very happy. I couldn't really sleep very well because I thought we would have gone in the day. I'm looking ahead is we'll be able to finish our exams successfully. As a live on the pulse here on the Joy News channel with me, Daniel Dazna. The leadership of KJB Asato Old Students Koso, um, Old Students Union Koso has presented 1,200 face masks to second and third year students currently preparing for their end of semester and final examinations. This gesture is to support government's efforts at controlling the viral infection among students. The president of the union, Michael Oting, says the fight against COVID-19 cannot be left in the hands of government at this time, considering the rising number of infections among students as they returned to school for their final examinations. Correspondent Peter Senu has more in the following report. The traditional councils of KJB and Asatu also benefited from the gesture as custodians on whose lands the school is built. The school prefect, Isaac Etonamajei, expressed appreciation on behalf of his colleagues. Uh, students of KJB Asatu Senior High School, I stand on behalf of them to say a very big thank you to you for this kind gesture. We are very, very grateful and we say that may the Almighty God continue to bless you the president of the old students union michael Otin, says the fight against covid 19 needed all hands on deck the old students union realize covid is real and uh, we know the school at at more uh, prone position and uh, being old students we have a commitment to make sure the school succeeds in whatever the government wants to do in preventing the spread of COVID-19. So the old student union wrote to certain organizations. Fortunately, CODA, Coastal Development Authority, agreed and assisted with some number of uh, PPEs so that uh, they can dispose the students for them to be able to adhere to the state protocols to keep them safe from COVID-19. Peter Sun for Joy News. Now, following announcements last Tuesday that a junior high school in the OT region had recorded a positive case of COVID-19, parents and basic school students say they are worried. Authorities have decided not to disclose the identity of the school. They are of the view that the disclosure would help them to better be better informed and take extra precautionary measures to stay safe from COVID-19. Parents and students have been speaking to correspondent Peter Seno in that region. Parents who interacted with Joy News in the region say they are apprehensive and want authorities to come clear on the matter. For the parents, it is better government discloses the identity of the school so they enhance protection for their wards. At least the school must be known to the public about the name of the student or uh, the person who has been infected can be kept confidential. At least government must come out to tell us there is that school that I recorded and the measure they are putting in place to keep that situation from many other schools not to record that. You understand? 
So it will be better the authority comes out to clear the air and put uh, our fears at rest. I've been a teacher hearing this news, then I think it's so uh, serious issue, which like me myself, my life is very important, and then the children as well, and then the parents. Uh -huh. So I think uh, it's, it's, it's a bad thing. So you think that they should have mentioned the name of the school? Yeah, least? like I would suggest they should have mentioned the particular school. It, it could be my school, but I don't know. If you announce, uh, uh, a school has half a uh, of 19 or coronavirus. I mean, we don't know the school. How can we know? So we, the parents, when it comes like that, we will be confused because our our our, our parents are there. Mohammed Isifu is the only parent who disagrees with earlier speakers. For him, officials must remain tight-lipped on the identity of the school. The school involved is aware of the case, which uh, necessary precaution should be taken to take care of the student there. Because if they make it known, it will create some fear and panic. And even the community in which the school is may even uh, do something to the school that should vacate the school, which may create problem. So I think it's good to keep the school that the infection is there a secret. But the school itself is aware of the case and precaution will be taken in the school. Some third-year junior high school students have also been sharing their opinion on the matter. If the name of the school can be mentioned, we can take it upon ourselves that the far, as far as this is the name of the school mentioned, we can take good care of ourselves and taking the necessary precautions like wearing the nose mask, washing our hands within at least two hours after and using the alcohol-based sanitizer as well as possible. We are afraid that we will be infected by the students because we don't know the school and we don't know the person who is infected. So maybe I can go and greet the person at a place and I will also be infected. The students and parents are therefore encouraging everyone to observe strictly the various protocols to stay safe from COVID-19 infection. Peter Sanu for Joy News. And I will also agree with the students that you must all stay safe and we must all stay safe in this COVID-19 era. You'll have on the post with me, Daniel Daze. Stay with us. We're speaking to the just chairman of the People's Progressive Party, PPP, in just a few minutes. And still have on the pause. Thanks for staying with us. Let's take you back to the OT region, which is celebrating one year since its creation. How are they coping? Regional correspondent Peter Seno will join us shortly for a conversation about the region. But first, his report on this milestone. OT region is one of the six additional regions created in the December 2018 referendum. The creation of the region had some opposition from chiefs, groups and individuals in the region. 13 months after the creation of the region, residents say they are hopeful development will take off in the course of time. Basit Alabani represents the artisans in the region. Uh, we are not in the normal times now. I believe that too is a factor. Uh, now the government focus has gone on to the COVID-19 uh, and uh, it's come back. So uh, as we go forward, we are pleading that they should read they should drive their attention to these promises that they've made to us as to the creation of the, the, the regions. Uh, we heard they'll be giving us a regional hospitals. We want to see it, we want to feel it now, so that uh, we believe what the exercise we've all embarked on has yielded positively to our regime. Engineer Abuaji Nyampong is the member of parliament for the Biakuya constituency. For him, it has been a good one year. One year is a short time. But then, so far it has been good because certain key decisions have been taken, like not concentrating all the um, establishments in one, in one town. I know education is in Jessica, uh, a Greek in a different place, and so on. It is a novelty that is going to help all the towns you know, have access to infrastructure, to development, and that is uh, very good for us, so that everything is not concentrated in one place. Dixon Yao Jambibi represents cocoa farmers in the region. For him, 
Hukou Board must consider establishing its head office in the region since it is one of the largest cocoa producing regions. Separate us from the voter region and creating OT, we have to enjoy from our cocoa productions. So your major concern now is that now you need your administrative offices, offices as a region? As a region. There should be a regional office for cocoa production in OT. The regional minister, Kwesi Ousu Yeboah, shares in his views. Yes. It's mainly for the OT region. The OT is not it. And yet, the cocoa board is not in the OT region. So I think that is a perfectly legitimate uh, demand on the part of our people. And I'll continue to pay you that for that time. We also get officers based here. For him, the region's continuous appendage to the Volta region is of serious concern to him. It is of very serious concern to me. OT is being treated as though, as I said, we are always an appendage to Volta or to the eastern region, which is, which is most inappropriate. Uh, we believe that having become autonomous administratively, to be able to be given, to be given the opportunity to chat our own course of uh, uh, development. The following institutions are currently operating in the region. For now, we have uh, regional directors of uh, feeder routes of our own, uh, of uh, highways, and of uh, urban routes. For several months now, the minister and some of his key staff have been living in hotel accommodation. This is due to accommodation challenges in the regional capital, Dambai. Meanwhile, the OT regional office complex and bungalows are at different levels of construction. The minister's initial accommodation, which used to be the accommodation for the municipal chief executive, is under renovation. Until such time that all these construction works are completed, the status quo remains the same. Peter Senu, for Joy News. I have been joined in studio by uh, my brother Lexis Bill. It's another Monday, and Lexis is here uh, as we look ahead to what's coming up on Drive Time on Joy FM. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited when I see you. Look at you. Yeah, How are you yeah, doing, look brother? At you, I'm good. I'm good. We've been dapper as always. Oh, please, please. You are, yeah. the, you are the dapper god. Oh, and <laughs> I'm particularly excited I'm able to sneak, sneak you away from Joy FM You know, studios. I'm live on radio and I'm on TV at the same time. All right. <laughs> like a magician thing? of sorts. Yep. It's like tech, is it technology or is it just... It's just uh, it's just village. proximity to TV. <laughs> <laughs> What's coming up this week, bro? So, I mean, I'm on air. We started drive time for the week every Monday at 2 o'clock. It's every weekday at 2 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So we've actually started the Motivational Monday edition. This week, we're dedicating it to men. Last week, we did it for the ladies, for the women. So it was it a was, great week. Oh, you did tune in. I, I know did, you I did. did, you know. And so the women had a feel of, you know, a little, a little bit of pampering, if I can put it that yeah. way. They got to share their stories and all. And this week, the brothers, Charlie, we've got stories to share. Mm. We've been mm. through a lot. You see, Charlie, be a man. <laughs> it's not easy. Bemi is suing and all of that. You know, Bemi is suing yeah. and stuff like that. Like, yo, what, what do you mean? I, I've been crying, bro. <laughs> what do you mean my Bemi is <laughs> you know? So the story that we're going to share today is going to be a touching one. At 4.30, we'll, go out, we'll have our drive chat as well. Tomorrow, you know, a musical battle every week. Yeah. Well, tomorrow we have two of Ghana's funnest groups, VIP and R2Bs. You got to make wow. a choice now. VIP and R2Bs is a tough one. Let, just, let me sleep on it. <laughs> <laughs> Wake up, brother. Wake up early. Let me because sleep on tomorrow it. Tomorrow at 2 o'clock, we'll have our musical yeah. flow down. We want to put these great acts together. It's really a form of celebrating them. Mm -hmm. But then again, Everybody has their favorites. Yeah, Somebody loves the trend of uh, uh, VIP to yeah. VVIP. It's, and it's, and because they have made some serious tracks. But, exactly. but I, I, think, I think that, to be fair to VIP, they've had more time than R2B. They've had a lot more time. I mean, go back to the days of um, Dabe Nodobeba. Uh -huh. And all through the days of Bessing, Manu Kho. Uh -huh. 
Well, actually, we just started, well, I think, somewhere in the late 2000s with Yawa Girl. You see, you didn't have to sleep on it. <laughs> <laughs> I already know no, where I, you I'm started I'm saying now. that VIP has had time. No, 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 but i 2 bs has also done really well. They've done so well. I mean, I mean, and they're still um, releasing some amazing yeah, songs. So that's the musical done. battle that's going to come out tomorrow. Yeah. On Wednesday, as usual, we have our drive, Dr. Dr. Osafo, coming in. Yeah. Yeah. And this week, actually, we started a conversation last week about women's health. Okay. So the week before, it was about erectile dysfunction in men. Mm -hmm. And we needed to do a follow-up for the women as well, because I understand that there are sexual dysfunctions with women as well. Mm, and important. the doctor gave us a very good preamble. And this week, we're going to look at some of the do's and don'ts so that the women can learn something from. Yeah. So on Wednesday, the Drive Doctor episode is going to be something else. And I'm not sure any woman will want to miss that. That's mm -hmm. going to be, that will be good. We, we created that time for women, even on Men's Week. That's, that yeah. just how yeah. much women are cherished. Yeah. Yeah, that we shows how important the women are. Really. Yeah, we had to. We had to totally. On Thursday, throwback Thursday, there's a debate in Shra. You know, he's always like yeah. arguing about something with Nigel. <laughs> One thing that or comes the other. on personality profile. This week as well, I share with you the story of an amazing man you would want to know. I'll, I'll keep the name on the wraps for now. But within the week, if you follow us on social media, hashtag drive on joy, you would see the personalities that we're interviewing as well. Mm -hmm. On Friday, there's a pop quiz. Oh, Which is really? also very exciting. I mean, you know how they say, are you smarter than the eighth grader? Uh -huh. uh -huh. So very simple questions, but people like you are always fumbling. <laughs> I know. I should, know. I, should I give that shot? No, no, no. it's okay. <laughs> This is my show. Young man. <laughs> Young man, you have come on my platform. Be careful. Okay, okay. All right, bro. <laughs> like, so it's an amazing so package amazing. for you yeah. this week on Drive Time on Joy. I'm so excited. And, and for those who follow me on Twitter mm. and on social media, you know that I'm an unashamed yeah fun of drive time on joy yeah i know i make no apologies for <laughs> my being a big fan of drive time on joy i still so have the us. videos of you rapping along your kanye and um, you, you actually careful. told me not to release those videos <laughs> but now i've got some leverage i gave it to you in confidence be very careful <laughs> but i can't wait i can't wait to see yeah what's yeah it's gonna start at 4 30. Yeah. I am knocking off a few minutes after 4.30. So and you join me on radio. Yeah, so if yeah, you're watching us you. now, once the pause is done, you definitely would want to tune in to Drive Time on Joy 99.7 FM. Great tunes. It's a motivational one. It's one of those shows that want to uplift you and make you feel a lot better. We know you're going through a lot. We know you're going through challenges. But listen, don't give up. It's not over. Definitely. It's not. It's not. It can't be. And with Lexus Bill, you know that there's so much more to look forward to. If you, are, if you feel like giving up, you wait for tomorrow's drive time. It's worth, it's worth staying up for. Thank you so much, Lexus. You can get back to radio now. Yeah, I'm good. I'm off. I'm off. <laughs> All right, now you're still live on The Pulse here on the Joy News Channel with me, Daniel Dazina. And there's so much more coming up right after this. Stay with us. Still live on the post. Thanks for staying with us. Now, MPs have been sitting in parliaments today to discuss matters that affect the lives of Ghanaians. Well, Joseph Opokugapo is our correspondent there, and he joins us via Zoom with an update. So, what has engaged the attention of parliaments today? Right, Joseph, you can hear me. Uh, if you can hear me, uh, what has engaged the attention of the MPs today? I guess all live here on The Pulse, here on the Joy News Channel. My name is Daniel Daddy. We'll soon be linking up with my colleague, Joseph Opoku Gapo, who is currently in Parliament. And he'll be, uh, he'll be updating us on some of the issues that Parliament has been discussing today. A number of key issues, of course, on the roster, as always, here in the House. Um, and we always endeavor to bring that to you live here on the Joy News Channel, of course. The, because of the voter registration exercise, we understand uh, not a lot of members of parliament have been in the chamber. It's one of the issues that we want to deal with um, because of the voter registration exercise. You find that, and those are the images that you have. You find that, um, unfortunately, a number or a large number of the members of parliament are not um, in the chamber. And so it's one of the issues that I'll be asking. We know, for instance, that um, the Speaker of Parliament is not in the House today. Earlier today, we understand that um, 
um, jo Joseph Fosse Wusu, who is the first deputy speaker of parliament, um, was is, is chairing that meeting. Now, the clerk to parliament, Cyril Lowe, in Sia, announced to the House today about the right honorable speaker, Mike Okwe's absence from the chair. Now, we're going to go ahead and look in look into a couple of the things that uh, happened to the uh, Dr. Bernardo Koboy, who is Deputy Minister for Health, Member of Parliament for Lejo Kukukro. He says that the uh, infection rate of COVID-19 in the schools is 0.017%. He, he presented a paper and he concluded by wishing final years for WASI the very, very best. He says that government doesn't wish for COVID-19 cases in high schools. Is this awareness that... Um, Veronica buckets have been provided in all schools. There are 178 cases, very important, 178 cases recorded in both senior and junior high schools with eight recoveries. All confirmed cases are in good shape. Let's get some updates on that from Joseph. So Joseph um, Opoku Gakpo has joined us. Now we understand that Dr. Bernard Okoboy made a statement today on the floor of parliament. Exactly, so he's been giving MPs an update on Ghana's COVID-19 situation and what is being done to contain it. Uh, he's been disclosing that the nation has spent about 34.6 million U.S. dollars on testing alone when it comes to COVID-19 at a cost of $100 per test, which means that uh, a lot of state resources have actually been sunk into the whole idea of testing for COVID-19. And uh, he goes on to make the point that um, there's also been additional expenditure on treating those who've been infected He's also been giving disclosures on what's been happening with healthcare personnel. He says about 2,000 healthcare personnel have tested positive. About 1,800 of them have recovered from the COVID-19, and they are working to ensure that the rest are also safe. Uh, he's been saying that healthcare personnel are being infected, not necessarily because of the absence of PPE, but a number of other factors as well. And he says that the nation's recovery rate when it comes to COVID-19 is around 84%, which is very encouraging. And so in summary... He's been patting the government on its back when it comes to the efforts they've rolled out to deal with COVID-19. But he's been getting responses from the minority side, the chief whip on the minority side, who's also a member of Parliament Committee on Health, uh, uh, Muntaka Mubarak, has been asking that government uh, pumps a lot more money into the COVID-19 containment. He says you think it's worrying that some contact traces were disengaged and the whole situation was left alone for public health prof professionals to do. And so he wants government to invest a lot more when it comes to testing and treating. And so those have been some of the conversations on COVID-19 on the floor of Parliament, Daniel. Right. And we understand that we have done 346,990 tests, Joseph, with a 7.9% positivity rate. Now, this interesting figure here, the cost of one test is $100, Joseph. Uh, exactly. And that's what Dr. Okoboy says then amounts to the $34.6 million, right. which is the money that they've invested in the whole testing so far. And he used that to make a point that uh, the, 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 looking at the cost involved in testing, uh, the advocacy for mass testing, which he says will bear no substantial results, wouldn't be necessary going forward. Because uh, he says that looking at the cost involved and the fact that when someone tests positive, uh, negative today, uh, it's possible the person may be positive tomorrow. Um, the, the, the whole case of the cost is how come mass testing wouldn't be necessary going forward. And so uh, he's been asking Ghanaians generally to adhere to the various protocols when it comes to COVID-19. And he's also been talking about, speaking of investment, the allowances that are supposed to be paid to healthcare personnel, about 50% of their basic salaries when it comes to frontline healthcare persons. He says for the month of April, they paid 6,000 frontline workers, another huge investment they are making into the fight against the COVID-19 virus, which is why he thinks Ghana should adhere to the necessary safety protocol so that more state resources are not invested just in that as far as dealing with the situation is concerned. This issue of frontline workers, Joseph, we know that the challenge had been the definition of frontline worker. As far as you know, and from what the deputy minister said today, is there clarity on that issue? Uh, he says that they are clear in their minds at the health ministry on who a frontline health worker is. And he defines a frontline health worker as someone who is working directly on an individual who has been affected by COVID-19 and that person is undergoing treatment. So 
that's the working definition they've given for healthcare, uh, frontline health workers, people who are directly uh, working on individuals who are tested positive for COVID-19. And he says uh, from the uh, identification that they say, they've identified 6,000 healthcare persons who fall within that particular category. And so for the month of April, they've done the payment of the 50% basic allowance to them. Uh, he makes the point that the process is ongoing. They will pay for the month that follows soon. But they are still going through a vetting and an auditing process. If there are any healthcare practitioners who think they fit that definition and qualification, they can submit their details. And when the payment is being done, it will be done to them. Muntaka Mubarak, uh, who is the minority chief whip and member of the health committee, uh, virtually contested the claim that there's been some payment of the allowance to these individuals because Muntaka Mubarak said that they've been getting calls and indications that a lot of the frontline healthcare people haven't received the said payment. And he urged government to rectify all of those anomalies that are distorted in the situation where some of them have not released their amount in question. Now, Joseph, uh, help me out here. The number that you said earlier for the number uh, that was given by the deputy health minister is 6,000 or 60,000? 6,000 for the Six. frontline health care persons. And so, the figure is 6,000. Mm. Yes, Daniel. So uh, if I can get that clarity, as far as the health ministry is concerned, the number of frontline health workers we have in Ghana are 6,000. Are 6,000. Per the working definition that he gave today in Parliament, as being people who are directly treating those who have been positively uh, infected with COVID-19. That is the working definition that they're given for those individuals. And they've identified 6,000 of them so far that they've made the payment of the allowances to them uh, for the month of April, and they are going through the processes to ensure that the subsequent months that follow the amount in question will pay to those individuals as well. That's quite interesting. Um, there's another issue I just saw here that caught my eye, that he said everyone who was in state quarantine was fed three times a day. Um, he said, right. So, so, so he made the point that uh, when it comes to the general treatment of COVID-19 patients, everyone who has been in a government facility for the necessary isolation and quarantine was first three times a day, adding on to the cost of investment in taking care of these specific individuals. Um, he, in, in making that point, he was explaining the kind of investment that they are making. So, for example, he went on to make a point that when it comes to the treatment centers that we have in Ghana, contrary to the claim that the treatment centers are getting full, he says rather the treatment centers are getting empty. And that um, with the, the, one of the advocacy that has gone on is that government should build a lot more treatment centers, which he says is untenable. Because then he says that all over the world, no one is focusing attention on getting everyone who is affected by COVID-19 into a treatment center. He cited the example of America and made the point that you can't envisage a situation where when they had more than 2 million cases of COVID-19, all of them will be treated in government facilities isolated. He says uh, for those who are ready and willing and have the capacity to self-quarantine or self-isolate, it's an international standard that they encourage people to do a lot more of that. And that it was possible that when the number of cases was in the hundreds, people can then be taken to treatment centers anytime they test positive. But at the stage that the numbers are hitting the hundred thousands and the ten thousands and the millions, the sustainable way around treating COVID-19 patients encouraging them to self-isolate and treating themselves and the latest protocol with the uh, World Health Organization 14 days uh, after which then they can come out rather than advocating for the construction of more treatment centers so that then these people can be sent in there. Uh, he'd also been reacting to, if you recall, the interview you did, Daniel, on Joy Prime when there was the disclosure that Ghana is actually leading in terms of the nations that are raising Africa's COVID-19 case count. Right. Uh, he says that the, uh, any assumption at all that uh, Ghana is contributing massively to that will actually be out of place. Because he went on to cite an example that you go to a country like Niger, which is doing very minimal number of tests, as compared to Ghana that is doing huge tests. He says the benefit of increasing the testing is that it keeps the mortality rate low. So for a nation like Ghana, South Africa, Nigeria, that are ramping up testing, you can't say that 
Uh, you can compare them to countries like Niger, which are testing very lowly, and see that Ghana rather is contributing to the case. For him, that is uh, someone displaying a lack of understanding of how the virus is playing out and the efforts that Ghana is putting in place to contain the situation. It's interesting you mentioned that, Joseph, and that was an interview that I had with the technical officer at the World Health Organization, and I asked her exactly that question about testing, and she literally stated that it cannot be the case, that it's simply because of testing that the cases are high in countries like Ghana and Nigeria. Uh, but Joseph, thank you very much. That was a very detailed, engaging discussion on what happened at Parliament. We'll let you go now. Uh, we'll come back when we have more details, particularly on what the Deputy Health Minister has been revealing there. And we just uh, had left Parliament where my colleague Joseph Opoku revealed 34.6 million has been spent on the fight against COVID-19, particularly treating of patients um, as far as, and, and testing um, as far as Dr. Bernard Okovoy, the Deputy Health Minister, is concerned. There's still a lot more coming up here on The Pulse. Before we go, the Sabalugu School for the Deaf is the only school in the four regions of the North that caters for all children who are deaf or have hearing impairment. Poor infrastructure delays in the release of subvention, among others, continue to impact negatively on academic work and the general well-being of the pupils. My colleague, Ernest Menu visited the Sabalugu School for the Deaf before the shutdown of schools, and here's what he found. A peaceful community full of cheerful and brilliant pupils whose warm smile and energy create a beautiful environment full of love. The silence here is golden. Established in March 1978, the school was initially set up as a unit under the Nyohini Rehabilitation Center in Tamale, but was subsequently moved to the Savalugu Middle Boarding School located on the outskirts of the town. The school is old and its classrooms and dormitories very deplorable. The campus is always eerily silent every time. That's not because the pupils here cannot speak. They speak in sign language, the language of the deaf. But this silence is often broken by the squeaks and squawks from the bats who share the dormitories with the 400 deaf pupils on campus. Though most of these students cannot hear the noisy bats, the presence of these animals seriously affects education. Gertrude Dasa, the immediate past headmistress of the school, explains. As you can see, the nettings and most of the things, the louvers, everything is up with time. And it leaks badly. Um, at the beginning of this rainy season, the portions of the roof was taken off, and we had to bring, buy some zinc, and then uh, we brought the situation under control. But still, it's not the best. It is. It is not good for people to live in a place like that. But it is not easy to get rid of those bats. We have sprayed the place, we have, especially when they are on holidays. That is something we are battling with. And we are hoping that when the renovation is done, maybe there are ways that they can prevent these bats from coming in. Do you have enough beds? Uh, they do not have enough beds if this year, as we are still taking them, if more girls should come. Uh, it will be a problem for us. Currently, they are sharing their facility with all manner of insects and a special type of flies, we are told, invade the campus around this time of the year. The pupils are also forced to share cups, bowls, spoons, and the tent dining in batches. This is certainly not ideal for COVID-19 pandemic. But all of these are exacerbated by the unhygienic situation attributed to the lack of reliable potable water in the school. 
In fact, the whole of last time, it was an ordeal that we went through. Their tanker was down. The tractor that was also helping us at the veterinary college was also down. It, <laughs> it was not easy for us. Mm. Yes. You can see that in our dormitories we have water closets. But we cannot use them because we don't have water. And if there's no water, you cannot use water closets. And that's it for The Pulse here on the Joy News, Joy News Channel. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Daniel Dazit. <laughs>